So we have been talking about uh, the supply chain risks in the uh, ecosystem uh, element resources. So in the resources are basically uh, the natural, human, financial and uh, industry clusters and so on. So we have seen uh, the, uh, the resources uncertainties uh, earlier. But uh, the energy, commodity and transportation costs wreak havoc even in the best run supply chains. So for example, you have volatile fuel, energy and commodity prices rank as the top three risks. Now the, the, the fuel which is oil that has gone to 150 and gone down to 40 and now settled at 100 and there is a lot of fluctuations and similarly there is a power shortage uh, which is happening and uh, the commodity prices go up and down and they are dropped the risks which are basically affecting the supply chains. Oil prices of course have reached uh, $150. Many companies question much of their globalization assumptions. So with these fluctuations, foreign exchange fluctuations, commodity price fluctuations, is it, does it make sense to have globalization here from the logistics point of view? So, what are the cost of uh, transporting the uh, the raw materials, and how much are you saving by uh, by this uh, uh, outsourcing and globalization? So, these are some of the questions which are being asked now. So, earlier the low cost labor, people are viewed as the best places to acquire goods and services. So why are you going to China, why are you going to India for IT, why are you going to uh, Malaysia? That is because they are the places where goods and services are cheap. But companies assumed permanence of inexpensive labor and under emphasized the impact of other costs. So people thought that this labor is inexpensive and it is going to remain so for decades. But that did not happen. The labor costs have increased both in India as well as in China. And they, what are the other costs that they said they think raw material costs will not increase, but they have increased enormously. Transportation costs, because the efficiencies of the transportation costs have, really, have actually been decreased as we saw over the last decade, but they started increasing because of the oil price increases and energy and made long term contacts. I don't know contracts between Brazil, India and China are examples of this. For example, let us look at one example, Brazil ships across the Pacific, 17 percent of the iron ore that China uses to make products for Americas, right. So Brazil which is a South American country, it ships some iron ore to China and China uses that iron ore to make products and send it back to America. So when you add up the incremental transport, energy, inventory expenses for such a transshipment, China's labor cost advantage over places like Brazil or Mexico largely disappears. In other words, supposing this Brazil itself makes these products or Chinese company actually puts uh, 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 installs a company in, in Brazil and it ships directly to America, then it will be a lot cheaper. A whole lot of product is moving extra 10,000 miles without realizing significant savings. Now this 10,000 miles which is it means there are a lot of gases, there are a lot of oil that is being used which is a natural resource which is in short supply. So if you take all these factors into account, then does it mean that this kind of thing makes sense? So the credit squeeze in the financial supply chain, for example, as we said before, the goods move in the forward direction where the, the, the finances move in the, in the reverse direction. Supposing there is credit squeeze at this end, that is the customer is, uh, who goes to a bank uh, for credit he does not get the credit, that then he cannot buy. Once he cannot buy, the retailer has no business 
that means he cancels the order from the distributor, distributor cancels from the manufacturer and manufacturer cancels the raw goods suppliers, goods suppliers and so on. So, this the, the financial this one here it basically goes back and it affects both the logistics providers who transport these goods across all this and also the raw material suppliers here. Now, the logistics this blue lines are the ones that show that affect the trade. So, that is what we saw the trade gets affected and so on. But supposing there is the LC credit squeeze has solves the LC that means this cannot go this financial flow cannot happen. So, the goods cannot move. So, that is also it is affected here. So, the both the financial and physical supply chains are interrelated and this. Now, this shows the, the bird flu outbreaks in the world. Uh, this was uh, this is a source in 2000, 2006. So, the red ones are the ones where uh, the bird flu out uh, countries with outbreaks and also countries with outbreaks including human cases is the, is the red ones. And so, you can see the whole of Asia Pacific got affected by that. And once the bird flu affects, what about the birds? And it gets to the humans. So, basically they have to destroy the birds and it has created a lot of problems uh, in terms of the meat supply and so on because it is the raw material for a lot of uh, meat products and that gets affected. So, the the resources which is the the out uh, which is the natural resource, which is the me, uh, the uh, raw material for the food products that is affected here. So, that we have seen two risks one is the supply chain risk second one is the resource risk. Let us look at what are the risks for the institutions. Uh, this economic and political related uncertainties affect business across all industries. Economic, economic slowdown, ec country policies and ratings, you know you have all these kind of ratings by the agencies, foreign exchange interest rates. So, if a foreign exchange, uh, uh, you know if the US dollar becomes stronger then it becomes uh, uh, good for the countries, uh, for all the companies which are in the, in the Asia Pacific, but if the US dollar goes down then it becomes uh, bad. So, the, the foreign exchange uh, fluctuations effect and also the political country to country relationship changes in the governments they are all affected and government policy changes, price controls, free trade zones, free trade agreements, inadequate public services, nationalization, barriers to uh, earning repatriation. This is one of the things that uh, can affect a company. Supposing a foreign company comes into a country, another country and whatever profits are there, the profits have, can, it, can it take back to its original headquarters? Sometimes the answer is no. There are security related issues like terrorist attacks and there is the country's, the company, the government's protectionist behavior, countries hiking duties against trade agreements. Textile quotas abolition by US and EU in January 2004. You know what happened was there was a WTA agreement abolishing textile quotas. So, the Chinese companies were sent lot of their ships on January 1st 2004. There was lot of shipments from China, the apparel shipment, textile shipments which were waiting at US and EU ports because there are no quota restrictions. And at that time, they, they have basically brought the voluntary uh, this one, and then they avoid the 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 both the EU and the USA they countered this using uh, anti-dumping uh, uh, legislation and so on. And they wanted China to have voluntary control, voluntary restriction, export restrictions. So auto companies, Malaysia has uh, this EFTA. EFTA is uh, Asia Pacific Trade Agreements and uh, uh, Malaysia has a, has, a, has a car company and under this 
auto, comp auto components needs to be freely exported across all these countries. Uh, but uh, Malaysia said because its company is getting affected, they, they refuse this. So, anti dumping is another protectionist behavior because any exp import that affects the local companies, the company government can stop the the import into the country. It can can stop saying that it cannot be permitted inside the country for because it is affecting uh, the local uh, companies. So, the government regulatory risk is uh, the most pervasive and subtle forms of discrimination against multinational companies is regulatory anti-dumping, changes in rules and regulations particularly in taxes and tariffs foreign exchange regulations, corruption, inspection, site visits, delayed payments, local company preferences for indirect material that is the government contracts. These measures are sometimes indebted to shield the uncompetitive locals and also to protect natural resources. Walmart could not enter Indian retail market and MCC was vandalized. So, basically these are some of these issues because the governments are want to protect their populations and that is where these, these rules those help. And of course, one should look at the patent laws. Before 2005, India protected only pro, uh, process patents, not product patents for pharmaceutical drugs. Now, uh, there is a difference between product patent and process patent. Process patent is the process by which you manufacture a particular drug, whereas the product patent is final content of the product. So, these Indian companies can produce the drug if the chemical synthesis or the manufacturing process differed from the patented one. So, this is this is the this is where I think the manufacturing equipment counts. So, you can you can take a patented drug and reinvent uh, the manufacturing process and manufacture this one, uh, manufacture the same drug and market it. And But Ranbax has set up sophisticated laboratories with hundreds of world class chemists and also invested in state of art factories to synthesize drugs that were going off the patent. So, there were several uh, um, uh, drugs which are going off the patents. So, they wanted to re-engineer uh, the whole processes and so on. So, typically it is a manufacturing uh, equipment. So, what people wanted to do is they know what it contains, so they know how the, uh, the other fellows are doing the manufacture, maybe they are doing under contract manufacturing. So, once it goes off, to the, off the patent and they wanted to synthesize new drugs by combining two or three drugs then and and uh, use the process patent to uh, to become uh, basically a top line manufacturers. What happened here in this patent class was that uh, if you look at uh, after 2005, the product patent is drug involves drug discovery. Now, when you are discovering drugs, there are two things. One is you are trying to find a new drug and that finding a new drug is a risky proposition. You have to do a lot of research and ultimately you may not be able to find one. Now, even if you find one, you have to go through clinical trials and uh, get the certifications from various governments and so on and that takes time. So, usually these things take uh, years and years. Uh, like like a, a 10 to 15 years to, to market a particularly bring a drug to the market. But on the other hand, if there is a drug that is there uh, already which is which is patented, you can always manufacture that. It is only manufacturing which is a low scale job. So, you can see the differences between the product patent and process patent. In the product patent, it involves drug discovery, clinical trials and bringing it to the market later. Whereas, if it is a process patent, you are imitating somebody, it is re-engineering 
uh, the, the whole process and if you have a manufacturing process you can manufacture those these drugs. For example, this HIV drugs 10 or 15 drugs has been combined into one and then uh, that was a very famous drug that Indian manufacturers have done. So, it is possible that uh, uh, these patent laws can affect the companies very badly. In fact, they did affect the companies very badly because research the product patent means that drug discovery is a very complex, highly risky proposition. It is time taking and to recover all the money that you have spent, it takes a lot of time. So, that is where pe uh, people have to be careful which uh, whether you are talking of product patent or process patent. You can say for example, this is a, a source from uh, 2008 AMR research. What are the kinds of risks that a company, particular company faces? Say you can see that intellectual property infringement, internal product quality failures, supplier product quality failures, supply chain security breaches, raising labor costs, regulatory compliance, supply failure, rising transportation costs, IT risk, commodity price volatility, shortage of managerial talent, natural disasters, immature physical infrastructure and offshore, in offshore countries, rising energy costs, lower consumer spending. I think we have covered all this under the three, this one. You can see in this, this particular slide will show you why uh, AMR uh, survey that intellectual property infringement is, uh, is, is, it costs high in terms of uh, the, in terms of the risk in global supply chain. And of course, the security breaches also is 41 percent. Shortage of managerial talent is 23 percent. And you can find out that all the risks that we have discussed so far are there and uh, uh, particularly lower consumer risk is only 8 percent. Raising energy costs, natural disasters, all the things that we have discussed so far are excess. And also you can find of course, this is only for China, I will show you for other countries as well. China has the top contributing region for 9 out of 15 risks including intellectual property, supplier and internal product quality failures, security breaches. This creates dilemma for many companies. I will show you the diagram here. For example, all these uh, 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 risks are here and here are the countries. For example, US, Canada, uh, Latin America and then China, India and so on. So, you can find that that US has regulatory compliance issues of 22 percent and China has 34 percent whereas, India has only 8 percent. And supplier product quality failures are high in China and they are low in, in India. And similarly, uh, volatile energy costs 31 percent very high in the US and it is less both in India and China. And so, this uh, basically is, uh, uh, is a, this one from AMR research again in 2008. So, you can find that uh, uh, both countries US, China, India and others, they each contribute to the various kinds of supply chain risks. And this particular table shows you that no country is an exception and it also shows that a variety of all the four uh, supply chain, this one of course, they, are, they did not know about uh, my uh, uh, supply chain ecosystem framework, but you can map all this into the ecosystem framework and find out which one is important in this. So, there is another one that is important nowadays is the sustainability or the basically the, uh, the GHG gases, the carbon footprint and so on. So, it is sustainability, there are three things that, that are important here. One is the economic development, the social well-being and the environmental protection. So, the, the economic development, governments are concerned about the economic development. So, they want to create industries, 
They want to create jobs for the people. And also the social well-being without many more jobs, then of course there, there is, uh, it is better and then uh, the retail is better and all the products, everything goes well and so on. So there is a social well-being is important and it is dependent on the enterprise impact on society. And enterprise impact is basically depends on the economic development. But the economic development can create environmental disasters. So you have to basically trade. This is a triple bottom line that people talk about. You have to trade between the economic development, environmental protection, as well as the social well-being. Now supposing you create uh, in the Himalayas, uh, uh, in, in the north of India, for economic development of that region, some factories, say auto factories. It is social well-being of that region, which is backward, and people get jobs and so on. But the environment gets this one because the, the all the components have to go to that place and also the finished goods like the automobiles have to come to the rest of the country creating more of uh, carbon footprints. So you can see that uh, it is always conflicting. But there is a conflict between economic development, social well-being as well as the, uh, uh, the environmental protection. So sustainable development is adopting business strategies and activities that meet the needs of the enterprise and stakeholders of today while protecting, sustaining and enhancing the human and natural resources of the future. So how much you could do it and this is the uh, this is an issue before most of the governments and so for that what people do is some people say the electric car, some people say uh, you know, gas uh, fired uh, engines and so on. So basically, people are trying to uh, trying to uh, balance out between the economic development as well as the environmental disaster and social well-being. So there are community risks. For example, in India, there are several uh, companies got affected because of the community risk and social groups. Tata Singur in West Bengal. This is a company that uh, uh, established uh, uh, in Singur in West Bengal. The Tatas have put the Nano, which is uh, 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 an innovation in itself. It's a one lakh car that is two thousand five hundred dollars at forty rupees a dollar, and that basically has created a lot of uh, problems. And Tatas have to finally move out and lost a lot of money because they have established the factories and their uh, suppliers or partners also established their factories and finally they could not get the, uh, the permissions of the farmers who own the lands to sell the, the land to Tatars and so they have to leave. And there is the Vedanta mining in Orissa, POSCO in Orissa, Nandigram, Goa SC Jets and uh, MCC in Bangalore, Reliance Fresh banned in several states and so on. So basically the Reliance Fresh is a, uh, is a retailer selling fresh uh, groceries but it is banned because it is going against the hawkers, it is going against the, uh, the, the Kirana shops, the small small uh, 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 players uh, who are basically selling these things in the streets. So for severity, severity reason, several reasons the community risk uh, happens and people have to be careful in terms of when particularly in when it is affecting a small players and also it is affecting the land has that needs to be procured from farmers. So one has to be extremely careful. The risk, the community risk is very high. And this is what is what happened in all these uh, cases. MCC is a uh, the Metro Cash and Carry, which is a, uh, uh, a wholesaler. And they have established their presence in Bangalore, India, but uh, 
uh, they were vandalized and basically I mean, they still exist in India with several other places, but they had several prop teething problems in the beginning. So, location decision conflict with the farmers. This is a point where uh, people I was saying that people have to be careful. This is the Tata Singur case where in the Tata land acquisition of, uh, of uh, I mean 1000 acres, 9000 9, acres uh, was stalled by protests launched mainly by the peasant farmers. So, they got they have acquired 600 acres and the rest 4000 was stalled and they have to basically move out of uh, the, this one. There are lot of infrastructure projects, there are time and cost overruns. Delays and cost overruns have significant impact. You know, there, for example, the, uh, the roads, uh, the railroads, uh, the metros, uh, the flyovers, all these basically have significant impact and people have to wait for the provision of public goods and services longer, limits the growth potential and reduces the competitiveness of the economy. If you want to build an airport and it takes 10 years to do it, then to that extent you are delaying the economic prosperity. Delays in land acquisition, shifting of utilities, environmental inter-ministerial clearances, shortage of funds and contractual disputes are major causes behind time and cost, cost overruns in India. Governments go for PPP. PPP is private uh, uh, public private partnership, but even those who are equally vulnerable to contractual and organizational failures. Although the government is a partner, but still projects with top gradation of Delhi and Mumbai airports, construction of Bangalore Metro and Delhi Gurgaon Expressway, PPP is experiencing major time and cost overruns or they have experienced major cost and overruns. So, execution of infrastructure projects is not well managed. So, in other words, when you are designing as, a, as an infrastructure project. And once the project is stanched, this one, the first thing is acquisition of all the resources including the land and taking agreement of all the people who are selling the land and so on. But if you start the business uh, before even acquisition of resources, then you get into the, the delays. So, basically this the whole project should start into execution only after the land acquisition and other things, other permissions are there and so on. So, that is where the, the, the problem comes uh, in terms of, of course, the government of India is trying to make rules uh, uh, to, to counter these things. So, also there is the issue of uh, terrorism which is affecting uh, the, uh, the supply chains a lot. In the 20th century, the world was confronted by adversaries who are stationary, observable and conventional. Earlier means war means what? War means there are armies and uh, people uh, go after another, they have guns, air, air war, uh, ship war and uh, land war and so on the enemies of weapons of choice which were tanks, planes, bombs, ships and so on and an individual soldier was not a significant threat to another national security. So, it is the army and it is the equipment that it has. It was what was counting yesterday, but today it is not. Today is just different. The adversary today is agile, unconventional and stealthy. The weapons are Microsoft, suicide vests, matches, machetes, AK-47s and roadside bombs. So, how do you counter that? If you have a container in a ship and if somebody puts a bomb in the ship so they explode at the uh, when, when it reaches the destination port, then how do you find that particular thing out? So, it is not, it is not an issue of you have a big army, you have tanks, planes and then you go declare a war and then go against people. But it is basically very unconventional and it is a single human being who is planting a bomb and so on. So, that is the kind of thing that is happening nowadays. Modern transportation um, it, 
and changes in demographics have further provided potential enemies in global reach. So, this created so called super powered individuals that have ideological motivation and also the material means to inflict significant harm to any nation. So, the, this particular thing of uh, uh, this one is creating a piracy, it is also creating problems of security in your transportation. So, what this actually means is you have to put each container, you have to check not only for the material this one and it, you have to also material for other things which are basically uh, can uh, affect either during the transport or after the transport at the at the port destination for bombs, explosives and other kinds of things. So, this is one of the uh, things that uh, is being added as a security measure or the transport security to basically look at check your containers for there is the homeland security in the United States which basically worries about the, the, the security of the transported goods. So, what are the risks in the delivery service on this one? Uh, delay or unavailability of either inbound or outbound transportation to move goods due to carrier breakdown or weather problems. I mean that is a very common uh, problem that risk that one faces. Failure of information and communication infrastructure due to line computer hardware or software failures or viral attacks leading to inability to coordinate operations and execute transactions. That is another one the IT. And of course, this is you can see in the picture that you can say while transporting the whole thing fell uh, into the sea and it takes time to uh, rescue this container. Cyber security is one of the connectivity. I think this is one of the modern problems of uh, interconnectivity which is the cyber security. Cyber security is basically where uh, computer systems are subjected to electronic attacks originating from sources that are usually unidentif unidentified. You know, somebody, if you have a nuclear reactor or if you have your factory control room, control tower, that control tower, the computer system which actually controls all your transportation to in and out of the factory from your suppliers and your accounts, everything that can be hacked and sometimes it can be misdirected instead of the saying that the supply should go to Europe, you can say it, it has to go to Hong Kong or it has to go to USA and so on. So, basically this is a much more, uh, this, this vulnerability is much more than a physical vulnerability because it can tamper with the information. The terrorists and counter net, counterfeit networks are also globally connected. Counterfeit is a big problem in auto, uh, in uh, pharmaceuticals it is about 40 percent on this one. In food products, yes, there is uh, 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 counterfeit products are also there. So, they are also globally connected. If you, you if you have a container as an RFID drag, uh, uh, tag to track it, well not only you can track it, even the terrorists can track it. So, that is where the problem is and indeed they follow the HR principles of recruitment, training people and also systematic planning processes for implementing their objectives. So, you can, you can see what happens at the airports and same things happen at the seaports in terms of checking the, uh, uh, the freight for any kind of uh, unsecure material inside the containers or in the ships. So, that is basically taking a big thing and also the cyber security this has happened in recent times that the hackers are able to get into the, the control systems or control towers as they are called or they, and their effect they, they bring down the computer systems which basically uh, bring down the entire manufacturing or the entire network. So, this is one thing that 
uh, one has to be careful and get the one on this one. Of course, there are the Somali pirate operations where pirates have expanded from 2006 to 10. In other words, this is we talked yesterday about the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. In the Suez Canal, uh, where the Indian Ocean, the Cape of Good Hope, but which avoids, which saves about 8,000 kilometers, the pirates have started their operations and they are increasing their uh, range. Pirates have expanded in the year 2006 to 10 and many of the world's most powerful navies are involved. And now what is happening is it, you just do not ship the products and to save the ship from the piracy then you have to have warships behind them or basically they are cooperating US, EU, India, Malaysia, Indonesia and South Africa. These navies, powerful navies are cooperating to guard their ships and the Japanese and South Koreans send warships to protect ships carrying cars. It is still cheaper. Then the question is why not go away of the Cape of Good Hope? And the question is it is still cheaper and convenient to pay higher insurance fees and take risk being attacked by pirates than incur the extra cost of diverting the vessels around the Cape of Good Hope. Well, if they divert around uh, Cape of Good Hope, the pirates, uh, pirates, pirates also can move to Cape of Good Hope. But these are Somali pirates, but they could be pirates which are coming from the Cape of Good Hope and so on. So, the issue is these operations of the piracy in the seas, in the high seas has become a big issue and this is like the same issue that we talked about like cyber security and also the security of in the uh, in the delivery technologies. So, these are becoming the big issues in the delivery of global supply chains. So, one thing one should remember is that high consequence low probability disruptions happen across the supply chain. Once your supply chain is is global, then there could be a supplier disruption somewhere in China or it could be one of the trucks that is coming from the supplier to the manufacturer can break down or there could be a cyber attack on one of your distributors uh, this one which is cancelling the orders to uh, this one. So, since you are basically distributed all over the globe, anything that affects any part of the globe, whether it is a thunderstorm, whether it is a, a terrorist attack, whether it is, whether it is a, a truck failure, it affects your supply chain. So, high consequence low probability disruptions happen all over the globe and your supply chain becomes highly vulnerable because of that. So, the other thing that happens is the risk propagation and amplification. In a globalized world, the risk for the supply chain could come from three other very important factors which are often ignored. One is connectedness on a global scale, large scale concentration of competitive efficiency, lack of governance structures for that. So, what you are saying is you say that okay, there are concentration of clusters in a particular place, let it be Vietnam, let it be China or let it be a region in a particular region and you try to put all your eggs in that basket and you try to source from that. But if something happens to that cluster, then all your production gets affected, all your supply chain gets affected. So, large scale concentration for competitive efficiency. Why did we have clusters? We were talking about the clusters as as a resources where clusters were created to basically have efficiency to have all the community of the vertical at one place so that they can share information they can share the business and uh, and also the other issues connected with collaboration but there is also a danger of the entire cluster get at getting affected either by shortage of power or cyber attacks or by natural 
uh, calamities or whatever. So, that is where the other thing. The other thing is a connected, a connectedness on a global scale. Either uh, the connectedness on a global scale for goods by transportation, there could be piracy effect. By information, there could be cyber security effects. By the flows, there could be a global, uh, there could be a financial crisis. So, for all the three flows, things can happen connecting because of the connectedness and the risk at one part of the supply chain trans gets transmitted to the other parts of this. And also, they finally, there is one thing that people know all these things happen. Then there are no governance structures, there are no uh, 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 organization structure, this one motivation to get these things on fast. In other words, can you detect a particular failure happening early? Well, bank failures or financial failures do not happen overnight. People have signals in terms of when you observe for the country's economy or the, or the company's economy or whatever is happening there, it is possible to detect, but people just ignore the warning signals. So, is it possible to have a governing structure where you take all these inputs and things can happen of course, by all of a sudden, even if they happen and all of a sudden some kind of uh, uh, mitigating action can be taken and so on. So, connectedness, large scale concentration, lack of governance structures are the three things. These are basically the managerial issues. These are not physical things that happen and one can try to correct this. In other words, instead of concentration in a particular geographic location which is affected by natural disasters or wars or something, it is possible to basically shift these concentrations to two or three places and so on. Similarly, getting a governance structure and doing some, some research depending on your company, your vertical to find out what are all the like, like what we are doing today is to find out all the risks that are possible. But people say, oh, if there are all the risks, if you list all the risks, there are thousands of them, how do you correct for them? Well, if you do not list all of them and if one of them strikes, which you thought it is unimportant, then what would you do? You will go down. So, it is important to find out, it is like, you know, in the human body, all the diseases it can come to any part of your body and so on. It is important to diagnose the appropriate disease and take care. So, GSNs or global supply chains as risk transmission and amplifier channels. Uh, for example, we already saw this uh, particular thing, credit crunch uh, that affected trade finance and prices for letter of credit have increased from 2008 and 2009 and preference to source from domestic suppliers during downturn because of trust of financing problems and greater protectionist policies and so on. So, uh, this is uh, what we have already seen uh, like uh, the trade decline as well as the synchronous uh, collapse of trade collapse in the this one. So, what is happening here is it is systems of systems and systemic risks. It is not just a risk meaning uh, it is not a component failure or it is not a machine failure. It is not a, a water pipe uh, discon getting disconnected or it is not a power failure or it is not a uh, labor strike here. Network of industries of critical infrastructures electricity, transport, communications have features of connectedness, large size and loose governance structures. Loose governance in the sense they are basically independent companies and they are all come together to supply and they do not have, uh, nobody has a hierarchical authority in this. These are systems of systems and they are subject to systemic risks uh, which means that entire system can fail. Connectedness makes individuals and organizations accessible over distance. On the positive side, victims of disaster are easier to reach because of the connectedness and emergency rescuers can organized more efficiently using satellites, wireless based monitoring and warning systems. 
and on the negative side connectedness connectedness multiplies the channels through which accidents diseases malevolent actions can propagate natural disasters at one end of the planet can have substantial economic and financial impact on the other epidemics spread more rapidly due to international travel and trade and tourism right so basically this so called connectedness of individuals and organizations it need not have to be basically uh, in terms of the supply chains it becomes systems of systems failures and it is a system of risk and clustering and concentration is global pressures in some industries encourage search for efficiency through large scale and high degree of concentration super aeroplanes gigantic dam projects giant firms in dhl flexotronics mergers acquisitions and geographical concentration low cost manufacturing in china it clusters in india auto pharma industry clusters and so on damage due to an accident is higher for a concentration rather than separate owners in separate locations bird flu effect in china in early years of this decade so you can see that the so called positive aspects of supply chains like clustering has negative effects many actors and risk governors so risk management need to be radically defined with changing role of governments in the economy and dismantling of state owned monopolies now earlier in earlier times all the most of this uh, like air, uh, <coughs> airlines the information technology companies like uh, telecommunications and the transport companies they were all the one way government but they are all dismantled and they are getting privatized and what happens to the risk management in this public relation issues related to risks nowadays involve variety of actors who are those actors corporations representatives of civil society non government organizations and experts risk situations might be met with excessive inertia and inappropriate institutional response as in 2011 bomb attack in bombay so what happened in 26 november 26 in bombay was that a group of terrorists have come into a hotel and they killed several people and they occupied the entire hotel and the whole indian army is outside whole of india is outside there are only five or six terrorists inside but they couldn't do anything they couldn't protect the the residents of the hotel and so on so basically it's a it's a inappropriate institutional response and an excessive inertia and so on there are several reasons for what happened there but such situations need to be met with uh, with care and so on so there there is many actors in the risk governance and the issue then will be what how do you create a risk resilient uh, supply chain so before we go into this let's uh, summarize uh, what we are talking in terms of the risk what we did in this um, so far is we have taken the four elements of uh, the uh, ecosystem the supply chain the resources the institutions and the delivery mechanisms and we talked about all the kinds of risks that happen and everywhere we have emphasized two or three facts one is there is the concentration of these clusters and second thing is they are all highly connected either through people to organizations or or through governments uh, through trade agreements and so on a third one is these are all loosely coupled systems each is an independent and there are several players and there is no organization structure that connects between them so that basically makes things difficult 
So if you want to have risk mitigation strategies and have a governance, create a resilient supply chain. What is a resilient supply chain? It is very difficult to create a risk-proof supply chain, not it is desirable. It's not desirable to create because it's going to be highly expensive and it is almost impossible. This is like finding a human being who will not who will not die. That's not happen. So, but how do you detect the risk, minimize the effect of the risk, and create mechanisms for resilience in a global supply chain? Now, you have one thing is to stop globalization, have local supply chains. Well, if that is so, then there could be risks in the local supply chains as well because nobody is aware, uh, averse to risk. It can happen anywhere, it can happen in China, it can happen in the US, it can happen anywhere in the world. And also it can happen to any organization, to any vertical. So it's important to create resilient supply chains. Non-globalization is not an issue or not an answer to this. So what we do is next is to talk briefly about how to create uh, resilient supply chains. That in the next class.